Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangram Saranam Gachami Yutiyam Te Buddham Saranam Gachami Yutiyam Te Dhammam Saranam Gachami Yutiyam Te Sangram Saranam Gachami Yutiyam Te Buddham Saranam Gachami Tatiyam pi dhammam saranam gachami Tatiyam pi sangram saranam gachami so, Good evening everybody on this uh, Wednesday evening Dhamma discretion and meditation practice. So, you know, over the last uh, several weeks, we've been covering the topic of the insight knowledges. And insight knowledges are the, basically follow the practice of the Satipatthana Sutta, especially in the, found in the Dhamma Nupasana. But it's basically the vipassana meditation system, uh, and it uh, necessi necessitates uh, achieving a, a good deal of concentration before before that hap would happen, uh, and it means like weakening the hindrances, overcoming the hindrances, because it begins with uh, the tuning in to the flow of impermanence, which means the moment to moment. Uh, coming and going of sensory contacts, moments of hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching, and thinking, as they are coming and going, but without clinging and holding on to them, seeing how they just arise, and if you don't cling or identify to them, they vanish very quickly, even our thoughts. So it requires the hindrances to be uh, greatly overcome before you can effectively practice that. But anyway, uh, we've been going over these, and uh, this week, uh, last week, we finished with cultivating that uh, sort of uh, the, the, the insight or the knowledge of dispassion. That means after having contemplated uh, impermanence and no self for the five aggregates, and again, the whole Vipassana meditation is focused on the five aggregates. Uh, and that's why at the end of this uh, printout, uh, that chart is there on the five uh, aggregates. So I hope you were able to read or reread uh, this uh, subject matter that we've gone over it already a few times in the past, but it's something you can't just look at once and remember. Especially if you read it without having a concentrated mind, it will just appear like some mumbo jumbo and won't make sense. So only when you attain the state of concentration, when you focus in on that, it's like lights go on in the mind because uh, the, the truths of impermanence, suffering and no self become quite evident only when you are able to see them uh, under that eye of vipassana the concentrated the way. So anyway, after developing those knowledges up to the dispassion, one develops this desire for deliverance. You know, I've talked about this again. The desire for deliverance is simply that uh, sort of that, you could say, intense or or deep desire to be free from the ignorance that's in our mind, not being free from the external world. Again, that's an important thing. 
A lot of people think Buddha should give up attachment to the external world and so on. No, it's the attachment in our mind to the objects, not the objects themselves. So anyway, uh, you observe all the crazy thoughts in your mind. You see how subtle and deep our defilements are. You might have seen how, okay, you thought you were free from a lot of desires or free from a lot of anger, but when you reach these deeper levels of uh, concentrated awareness and insight, you realize, oh my gosh, I do have, I still have greed, <laughs> you know, aversion and ego and things like that because they're concealed if you don't pay specific attention to our defilements. They're very crafty and very canny to uh, subtly conceal the reality to us as long as we have that sort of identification and clinging to them as being me and mine and I'm doing this and these things are real and these things are you know the essence of happiness you know what you can see things smell, touch and think about people base their whole life on happiness on those things so uh, and you know people are clinging to these views very strongly so that's why the Vipassana system is very powerful it cuts through that, but again, you have to have reached the state of good concentration in order to clearly see it. So, uh, when you do have a good glimpse of that, this, this desire for deliverance uh, would arise in the mind that really strengthens your motivation. It really, like, uh, really strengthens and sees the sense of urgency not to indulge in your habits. And, not to think, oh, it's okay, you know, tell a little lie here and there. It's okay to indulge in some negative things now and again. You see the danger in, in even those uh, subtle kind of defilements as uh, always be reoccurring. So, uh, and, and that is necessary to keep your practice going forward because at this point, a lot of people get complacent, especially when they reach that uh, level of uh, you know, dispassion. You think, oh, I'm not attached to anything anymore. And then you reach concentration and you have some equanimity and they, oh, you know, I've, I've, I've reached, they think they've reached some higher level than they have and they kind of give up their practice or at least let off the gas pedal, so to speak, in terms of, uh, you know, maintaining their, their concentration. So that's why this, uh, desire for deliverance is a is a stage in which you you refocus in uh, your practice you know re motivate your practice not to, you know, to let it slip and even to try to you know increase the, the length of time that you meditate because the longer you meditate deeper defilements come up like being irritated being disturbed by pain or uh, also deeper repressed thoughts and emotions like pride or conceit may come up uh, and you're forced to look at those and those also have to be let go of and uh, you know overcome in order to kind of go through. so <clears throat> now then after that desire for deliverance comes what's called reflection knowledge and reflection knowledge means you, you keep reviewing, you go back and you examine all the five aggregates in terms of anicca, dukkha, anatta, even these subtle ones that you are now being able to observe in the rapidity or the, the quickness that you're seeing things arise and vanish. And because you can literally see hundreds, even thousands of different sensory uh, contacts arising and vanishing, even in the, in the space of, you know, a minute or even less. Uh, that's how powerful the mind becomes. It becomes like an electron microscope actually at that stage. That's why, required, that's why it requires really to be in the first jhana to be able to see that kind of uh, uh, you know, you know, impermanence, the deeper meaning of impermanence. So you reflect you reflect on the Paticca Samapada, you reflect on everything that you've learned in the Dhamma and your insights until, you know, you completely transcend doubt, not, not one shred of 
of doubt about the existence of a permanent self or anything permanent that you know, you've, you've, you've really seen. So that's that uh, repeated reflection, reflection uh, um, on the Dhamma. In terms of Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta, and that's why it comes back to that diagram at the end, uh, even in that uh, sixth level of insight knowledge, or the seventh level, um, is uh, you keep on you know, reflecting and contemplating the, the Dhamma, but it, it, it's at a much higher uh, level in faith and joy and so many positive mental states uh, arise in your mind. And then you achieve equanimity. Equanimity is that to be the, uh, the the eighth stage of the insight knowledge, and that is after the mind has been totally, you know, uh, developed in complete detachment, and, and the hindrances of doubt and everything else are. You know, cultivated spiritual faculties are primed and, and balanced. Then, if you can hold that state of equanimity, and basic equanimity means the mind is not bending toward any of the sensory stimulation, is not being attracted to any pleasurable sensations, is not having aversion or uh, uh, to any even painful sensations. By that time, most of those would have subsided anyway because the mind has stopped uh, paying attention to them and has developed this very deep state of uh, equanimity, in which even the sense of self and ego uh, recedes to the very background of the mind. It's almost like a disappearance. And, and our conditioned world also basically kind of disappears because you're no longer thinking about it's thinking that brings the world into focus and thinking and uh, identifying with what you are experiencing. So by this time, when you attain that state of real equanimity, mind has ceased all that mental activity because of previous contemplations one has done. And so if you can maintain that state of equanimity long enough, then the what is called the, the conformity knowledge arises. And uh, this is a very important, uh, uh, you know, sort of the penultimate stage of uh, developing the Vipassana meditation. Conformity knowledge means the mind is now conforming to the truth. So you've been contemplating for months or even years, you've been contemplating you know, developing, you know, concentration, you develop, practicing four foundations of mindfulness and, uh, you know, other meditation techniques, but especially the four foundations of mindfulness and, and developing the insights into anicca, dukkha, and anatma, or anatta. That means that everything is impermanent. And if you cling or identify with as yours, any of those uh, five aggregates, then disappointment and suffering is going to arise. And that, you know, there's no ultimate owner or controller of your body or even of your own mind and your own consciousness, even though you think you are, but of course that's an illusion that you've already uh, understood by this point. So anyway, uh, so the mind starts letting go. And, and letting go means your ordinary reality, there's a paradigm shift that occurs in the substructure of consciousness. It's a paradigm shift. It's like the, the, the struct, even the atomic structure of, you know, within the cells and molecules and so on, it goes through a shift from one of a self-centered view to, uh, you know, it's the unconditioned. In other words, it's not creating any mental pictures or ideas of any anything really. And so you kind of experience an emptiness. So that would be included in you know 
when people talk about emptiness and I meditate on emptiness or something like that, this is probably the, uh, you know, the beginning of the true actual existential ex experience of emptiness as it's within the consciousness. Uh, so, and <clears throat> so at that point, uh, th that means the mind is conforming to the truth because this is what we've intellectually kind of been thinking about for many years, right? And, and in meditation, you get little glimpses of that. Uh, and so, you know, you kind of, you know, understand that a bit, but now it, it's like, a, you know, bam, it's a full whammy, it hits you right in the face, uh, but not in a, in a scared way. It's a, you know, the mind just falls apart. And, uh, but now ordinary, a person would get afraid of this because they're afraid they're going to die or they're afraid they're going to be sucked down a black hole, whatever you imagine it to be. Uh, and, and so if they're still clinging to the self anyway, they'll be jerked back into their uh, active thinking and so on, because it's, it's really like the fear of death, but it's fear of ego death. You're not going to die physically, but it's ego death. And actually that's real death uh, in terms of uh, the Dhamma. Uh, but anyway, so anyway, the mind is starting to conform uh, to this, to the, to the truths that you've already been studying in that way. And you've already been, I mean, this doesn't happen all at once, you know, it's, it's usually a gradual thing and you get glimpses of this all along the line for many years, even you might have happened, but finally it's, it's coming all uh, together. Uh, so anyway, it's called conformity knowledge. And then the next stage is what is called change of lineage, that the mind, it passes out of the state of an ordinary whirling, or what is called mundane, uh, and enters the supramundane. Uh, so it's called a change of lineage because it, it, this is a you know, difficult term to understand, but uh, the lineage means a lineage of being an ordinary earthbound person to the lineage of the Dhamma, uh, the lineage of the uh, lineage of you know, the, you know, the enlightened person. But we haven't reached enlightenment yet. There's only the first stage, uh, and this change of lineage uh, results in becoming a stream enter or a sotapa, and destroying the the first three of the ten fetters that I've already I've talked about in other talks too. But, uh, but <clears throat> so that is the culmination, and that is called the right uh, uh, insight and the right knowledge, uh, uh, or the ninth and tenth stages of the Eightfold Path. When we talk about the Eightfold Path. You know, and it ends in you know right mindfulness and right concentration. That takes you up to, uh, let's say you're walking along a path or a forest, or and then you you come out of the forest, you come to a edge of a cliff, a cliff, right? steep cliff with a sheer drop off, and maybe you're being chased by a lot of people, or you know you come to the edge of the cliff, and you either go back or you jump off. And so the conformity knowledge, the change of lineage is like taking a jump. The mind jumps off the cliff and not even one toe remains on uh, that bank. Uh, because of the trust in the Dhamma, your, your trust and faith in the Dhamma is so cemented at that point, you have full trust that whatever happens is going to be great. You know, there's, there's no fear. So, uh, that's called the, the right knowledge and right liberation. So the right knowledge is the knowledge of entering the stream, the knowledge of uh, the supramundane path. At that point, you've entered what is called the supramundane eightfold path. Up to this point, you've been practicing the mundane eightfold path, 
What is this point of change of lineage, conformity and change of lineage and entering the stream? Uh, you are now what is called standing on the, the super mundane. Why? Because it's called super mundane because it has that super mundane knowledge backing it up, at least <clears throat> to the to the limit that a sotapanna uh, has. That that's still in a weak stage, but nevertheless, it's still uh, there because of that uh, uh, experience of. You know, seeing the venal self. So, uh, that is basically sort of the uh, cultivation or the culmination of these, uh, those insight knowledges. Now, I want to read a, a nice little sort of analogy or a story. Uh, it, it's an analogy of somebody who goes through this conformity knowledge in change of the lineage and uh, you know becomes a sotapa. So this is found in the Vishuddhimagga. Uh, <clears throat> so if you can imagine this, try to kind of, try to follow along kind of in your you know, imagination maybe, okay? So uh, let's say there was a you know there was a tree. It says once upon a time there was a bat you know, like a fruit bat, that alighted on a certain tree that had five branches. And this, this bat was thinking, I shall find some fruits or flowers on this tree. So, you know, it was flying around, he saw this tree, and he thought, wow, that, that tree looks like a nice tree. I'm going to you know, land on it and get some flowers and fruit. So he lands on this tree, and he starts investigating all these five branches, goes up one and then the, but he doesn't find any flowers or fruits. You know, he investigates one, like the tree of the body for, these are the five aggregates, these five branches are you know, an analogy for the five aggregates, right? So he goes to the body and finds that's empty of any concrete self or any ultimate satisfaction. And he goes on to the branch of feelings, pleasurable feelings and uh, so on. And he sees how they're just impermanent and fleeting and they don't really bring any lasting satisfaction. Uh, and they wind up usually in disappointment and change because of their impermanence. So he leaves that branch and he goes to the branch of perceptions and searches that branch for any flowers or fruits and finds that barren also of any ultimate, uh, we're talking about ultimate satisfaction and knowledge and, and joy. And then he goes on to the next one of the sankaras, the, the mental formations. That means our thoughts, our emotions, and all of our you know, accumulated habits and so on. And he finds those empty of any uh, ultimate satisfaction. He sees the danger and suffering and the being attached to them. And then he even goes on to the fifth branch, which is consciousness. And he examines those again. So he, there's no self here. I mean, it's just it's just conditioned phenomena, you know. And he sees the clinging, you know, clinging with selfish uh, attachment and ignorance to this idea of a me or mind, you know, is the ultimate cause of suffering. So he, he finds that branch of consciousness also barren of any uh, fruit. So that bird loses interest. You know, the, in the tree, you know, having examined those five branches, which are the five aggregates, as it's already had been doing in the previous you know, the knowledges that I had mentioned. Uh, it goes to the, the straight trunk. And it said the, the, the bird climbs up on the straight branch and pokes her head out of the branches and sees the clear blue sky. And it alights from that branch. And that alighting from the branch is like conformity knowledge. And then it flies and lands on another tree. Uh, and that's its change of lineage. That means just changing trees. It changes from one tree to another. Uh, 
So anyway, that's just an analogy about how the mind leaves the world of the conditioned world, the I me mind world, and uh, you know, like jumping off the cliff. You know, you've got to <laughs> you've got to jump with both feet off the cliff. Uh, And of course, you know, it's an analogy, right? So don't take me literally, you will jump off a cliff. But uh, so that's one analogy. But, but there's another one that's even I, I like better. And it's an analogy uh, of a person who's maybe he's running from a lot of dangers in the forest. And again, he, he comes to a, ride, a river, right? And he sees uh, a rope hanging from a branch, you know, in, in, at, near the bank of the river. And maybe there's a lot of dangers. Maybe he's getting chased by a, you know, a, a bear or a, you know, a lion or something else. And so he sees this rope. And he, he jumps from this bank and sails and then grabs a hold of that rope, you know, over the river. And the weight, the momentum of his body that's been flying, you know, four or five feet through the air, grabs a hold of that rope and that rope swings out across the river and over to the other bank and gets over the other bank. And if the person doesn't let go of the rope, right, they're going to come back to the, the bank that they just wanted to leave. So they get over the bank of the, on the other side and they let go. And that's the change of lineage. They let go and they drop to the ground and their feet on the ground of the other bank. That is the change of lineage. Uh, and so when the person runs and they jumps toward the rope, their feet leave this bank, that's conformity knowledge. That means they have no more fear. They're absolutely convinced that that rope is going to bring them to safety. Uh, and that's why they, they, they commit their whole life to that. You know, because in the river, there could be crocodiles or something. So uh, that, uh, that illustrates again the conformity knowledge is you know, leaving this bank uh, with both feet and then swinging out over the other side, but then you have to let go. Like that bird had to fly off that branch uh, to reach uh, a new tree. So in the same way, you let go and uh, drop down on the other bank and walk uh, with free. So, Again, this, uh, these are analogies to kind of hopefully kind of illustrate at least a bit the, the process that occurs uh, through this practice of, uh, you know, sort of advanced uh, vipassana meditation and the development of those uh, you know, insight uh, knowledges. And it's really based on the, the faith. You have to have faith in the Dhamma. Because in those advanced stages of meditation, whether you're practicing concentration and, uh, or especially in the Vipassana uh, awareness when you're developing the Vipassana jhanas and, and you reach that point where the, the sense of self and the world starts to dissolve, uh, you're going to freak out if you haven't developed that faith. and you haven't overcome your fear of death, you're going to freak. That means you're going to you know, the body's going to convulse and you're going to have a panic attack uh, or something like that. And uh, the mind is going to get jerked back into its condition. That's why all of that, that's why those inside knowledges, is, is this something you don't practice for a week and attain all these things? No, no, no. Uh, and it involves having, you know, follow the Eightfold Path, and, and sila, samadhi, panya, having developed the spiritual faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, uh, developed the seven factors of enlightenment and uh, many of the other aspects of Dhamma that you might have uh, 
But that's really, uh, you know, really the practice of Dhamma, and, and that's, that's its uh, culmination. And unfortunately, most people probably don't practice enough to, to come to those levels. But you can get some inkling of it. You can get some little glimpses whenever you do reach a concentrated state. But you have to, you have to uh, maintain your focus. That's the time to reflect. Not to say, oh, wow, we, we, I reached emptiness. No, no, no. That's the time you have to double down and you have to do the reflection knowledge. And you have to, uh, you know, overcome your doubts about, uh, you know, impermanence, uh, you know, happiness, and, and self, or, you know, develop the insights into anicca, dukkha, which the whole of the Buddhist teaching is. Okay, so I know it's a lot of uh, material there, but it's it's really wonderful, and especially when you start really getting in and practicing the insight knowledges. Uh, you know, there's never a dull moment, uh, uh, but and that's why it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an advanced level. It's beyond the jhanas. You, know, you have to even go beyond the jhanas, getting detached from just hanging out in jhanas, so good peaking and, and so on, and. and uh, you know, go to beyond those to use that power of the jhana to then develop these insights and to transcend uh, the sense of uh, I need. Okay, friends, so I think I'm going to stop this uh, talk here. And uh, there was one question that was sent in to me by an email, but I had. Uh, already answered that person by email and uh but it was basically a question about the diagram that comes at the end of the 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 mailing attachment that i sent out so if you're able to look through that whole attachment on the last page after the explanation of of all those insight knowledge there was a diagram of five concentric circles and uh down at the bottom, anicca, dukkha, and nanatta. So the question was, are these things related, these diagrams related to anicca, dukkha, and nanatta? And I replied to this person, absolutely. Uh, because uh, anicca, dukkha, and nanatta are about the five aggregates. And the five aggregates are about anything you could possibly experience, anything you can see, anything you can hear, anything you can smell, anything you can taste, Anything you can feel on the body and anything you can think about or experience through the mind belongs to one of these five aggregates. And uh, so that's why the, the whole of the Buddhist teaching, if you really study it and observe it, you'll see that that's what he taught. You know, suffering, cause of suffering, uh, and the way to lead, and that there can be an end to the suffering, which is the clinging and grasping to uh, self and the aggregate. And then the path to do, which is what we were already doing. So, anyway, uh, now if anybody has any uh, further questions, you can uh, see there's something in the chat box. So let's take a look at that. So, This question is, uh, how difficult is it to reach the stage of stream entry? And how does one know that one attains the stage of stream entry? Think so much. Uh, well, if you were listening to this talk, and my explanation is that before you even can practice these insight knowledges, you were needed to attain a a good degree of concentration, weaken the hindrances, and that comes through practicing sila, samadhi, and panya. That comes from practicing the noble eight four path and developing a consistent and regular uh, practice of meditation uh, for over a long period of time. And how long it takes, uh, that's an individual matter because everybody has different amounts of karmic accumulations, different amounts of defilements, and some people could attain stream entry even by hearing a Dhamma talk, actually. And many people have. 
uh, but other people could meditate for years and years and years and uh, maybe not uh, uh, so it's 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 an individual uh, uh, you know a lot of the comma is connected with that so it's impossible to really say but those factors of the eightfold path developing the spiritual faculties and developing uh, tranquility and insight, those are, uh, except for a very rare individual, those would have had to have been uh, practiced uh, to a large extent. So, And how does one know that you attain this stream of truth because of that analogy of leaving the bank? There's, there comes a, a definite shift in your consciousness occurs. If that doesn't occur, then I don't think you've attained the stream of truth. Uh, you know, it's like weakening the foundation, you know, of a tall skyscraper, like, you know, in the, in the 90s when somebody terrorists tried to blow up the Twin Towers, you know, they ran a truck full of explosives, and it weakened one of the foundations, but it didn't topple the building, you know, and uh, so, but it weakened the foundation. So when you're team in stream injury, it weakens the fetters or overcomes the fetters of personality, belief, doubts, and attachment to rights and liberty. And so that, that, you know, uh, some kind of a paradigm shift occurs, but you still have, you can still have desire and aversion and certain kind of habits, but you would never break a kind of a precept that would cause you to be reborn as an animal or in the lower realms of suffering. So basically you wouldn't break any of the, the major types of uh, the precepts, uh, especially that of killing a human being in, uh, some other ones. So anyway, that's a controversial point that you know, scholars may argue about. But anyway, it's something had to change in you. That's the main thing. If you notice something had definitely changed, something dropped out of your mind, some, you know, then it's a good possibility you may have changed. Uh, Bhante, I can I ask a question? I go to this next uh, chat first, okay? <clears throat> and this question appears that until one attains change of lineage, they could fall back and lose the benefits of attainment. No, you have to change. Uh, you have to change. Uh, uh, you know, you have to let go and uh, fall to the other bank. So the, the, you know, the change of lineage, right? You know, that's right, you could fall back. That's why uh, normally one wouldn't, if you've attained that conformity knowledge and you've reached the equanimity of formations, then that, as the, Conformity knowledge means your mind is already transitioning into emptiness and into uh, the, the the bonic element, at least for a momentary uh, flash, and uh, and that causes this paradigm shift in the consciousness to uh, occur. So, uh, but you can fall back from equanimity. You know, there's a nice another little of analogy with equanimity. That equanimity, equanimity again is that eighth intellect of knowledge. And conformity comes after equanimity. If you can't maintain the equanimity long enough, it's like in the old days when there were sailing ships. And in order to find land, when sailors were out in the middle of the ocean and they were trying to find land, they would let go of, like a homing pigeon. And the, the homing pigeon would fly out. If it didn't find any land, it would come back to the ship. 
But if the thing landed, it would go to the land and wouldn't come back. So the sailors would say, oh, the crow hasn't come back, then you know, there must be land over there. So in the same way, you have to stay in that equanimity level long enough. And then that change of lineage or the conformity knowledge conforms to that. That means the crow sees land and it keeps on flying. It doesn't come back. It saw the land. That means the conformity knowledge saw the land. I've seen the promised land, as some famous person said, right? Uh, uh, so, you know, it's like the, the crow, he, 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 he leaves the ship in that, in that conformity knowledge, but he sees the land and he keeps on flying and he lands on some tree on the island and that's his change. And now he's not going back to the ship, he eats all the fruits. So <laughs> that's another kind of a, a analogy. But until that, if, if the crow doesn't find the land, like you've attained, uh, if you've attained equanimity of formations and you're still not totally convinced about no self, then <laughs> your mind can be drawn back. Of course, even attaining stream entry doesn't mean you're enlightened. And you could fall back to a certain extent. I mean, you're going to come back to kind of ordinary thinking, but you're not going to, uh, there's enough change would have occurred in you that you're totally convinced of the Dhamma and you're not going to give up practicing really. And, uh, but still, it, it may take years and years or even up to some lifetimes to eventually purify the mind of its remaining defilements. So. But, you know, you'll never fall back too much because that insight leaves an impact on you that, sure, certain habits, you can't just erase them immediately, uh, but uh, you certainly would be in a better position to uh, keep making progress on the mind. So this uh, question, can you please talk about the dissolution of the five aggregates and stream into As I cultivate and meditate, I can only have momentary experience of the non-self. Body feelings are not the mind. That's because probably your uh, concentration has not been developed strong enough, or the other the spiritual faculties haven't been uh, uh, developed so that uh, you, you can't uh, sort of maintain those just momentary little experiences uh, long enough. Uh, so it, it's just a matter of continuing to uh, practice and trying to even to you know, sit longer and challenge your defilements and, and other things by enduring pain longer and, and uh, you know, keep on studying and, and so on. And there's no way you can predict uh, when that will happen. Okay, this last question. What is the difference between enlightenment and Nibbana? Actually, there's no difference from the, from the Theravada standpoint, uh, you know, the Theravada teachings. Attaining enlightenment, the, the stream enterer, Sotapana, is said to be the first stage of enlightenment. But there's levels of enlightenment. So the first stage is, you know, the Sotapana has gotten a glimpse of Nibbana, and he's overcome certain defilements, and he can't be turned back. The mind cannot let, totally let go of the Dhamma, it will keep the, there in his mind. Uh, so it's like bringing light into a room. If you're in a dark room and you're stumbling around and uh, you, know, you can't see and you're banging your knees and elbows and head on things that are in the room, that's before enlightenment. Now you attain Sotapanna and it's like uh, somebody lights a match. In the dark room where you got a match and you light a match and so for a few uh, seconds while the, the light is on the match you see oh there's a big closet over here there's a refrigerator over there and you 
kind of see uh, the room lit up a bit, but the, the light, light, the match goes out. It's dark again. But now you have a memory of it. Ah, okay, to the left there was something over here, to the right there was something, okay. Now you'll be more careful, right? So you'll be more mindful. And so you'll put out your hands before you start rushing into things. That's mindfulness. You're putting out your hands before you rush into something. And so uh, you touch, okay, I won't go there. And touch this, okay, I won't go there. And you can kind of navigate through the room a little bit. But still, it uh, takes time. But then, later on, you get a dimmer switch. Instead of just having a match that goes out after a minute or two, you can, you can turn up the dimmer switch, you know, maybe about half speed. And now, you know, the, the room isn't totally dark and it continues on a dim light so you can see even better. That would be the attainment of the so once return. And then you turn up the, the switch even more so the room becomes more bright. And that would be like attaining the never returning. And then finally, you turn up the dimmer switch to full brightness and the room, room, room becomes totally bright and clear and that's like the final attainment of uh, Nibbana. That, that might be a, the only uh, clear uh, analogy of, you know, like those stages. So that's about all I can say about it uh, at this point. Okay, so friends, uh, we've already uh, covered a lot of ground and thank you for your questions. Uh, and uh, I hope that maybe brought some clarity uh, into some aspects of, of that. And uh, anyway, I encourage you to keep uh, uh, practicing. Okay, so uh, now uh, we're going to take a short break and then come back and do uh, some few yoga uh, stretches and some deep breathing and some yoga to kind of loosen up the cellular vibrations so we can have a a good awareness of the body and get centered in the body so that we can hopefully tune in to uh, the flow of the brain. Okay? Okay, we'll see you back in a few.
Oh no. Dear Bante, you need Bante, to we cannot hear you. yourself. You are muted. You need to unmute yourself, Bante. Okay, got it? Can you hear me now? Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> we'll just try to feel the outline of the standing body. Then begin some deep, slow breathing. Take about three or four seconds to expand your abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest. Hold the air in the lungs for two or three seconds. Allow all the oxygen to get into the bloodstream. Then slowly breathe out, feeling the last bit of air go out of the lungs. Just take a few more deep, slow breaths like that, cultivating this mindfulness. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Hold the breath. Breathing out, standing here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, standing here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. 
Now we're going to combine this breathing with these movements, stretches, movements, doing the movement on the in-breath, holding the position for two or three seconds, returning to the starting point on the out-breath, repeating each exercise three times. The whole time, just keep letting go of your thoughts. Just keep the mind focused in the body, feeling the sensations. So in the next in-breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch your head back, and look at the back of your hands, stretch upward. The out-breath, turn the palms down, touch the top of the head. Again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, bend back a little bit, stretch upwards, feel the sensations, feel the arch in the lower spine, out breath, touch the top of the head. Third time, hold the upward stretch longer. You bend back a little more, feel the sensations. Release the fingers and the out breath, arms back to the sides. Just close the eyes, feel the increased sensations, pulsations in your hands and fingers. Just try to feel the outline of the standing body. Just mentally remind yourself of the present moment of standing, standing, standing. Let go of all your other thoughts coming and going. Just think about standing, standing, standing. Okay, on the next in breath, push up on the toes, raising the arms over the head in this way, facing the Hands toward each other a few inches apart and stretch up. Out breath, come back down. And coordinate the breathing with the movement. Use the in breath to help lift up the body like blowing up a helium balloon. Body rises up. Out. In. Stretch. Out. Just gently close the eyes. Just feel the increased sensation hands and fingers or other places, feel the clothing touching the skin, increased heart beating. Just keep remembering standing, standing, don't give the mind time to get lost in unnecessary thoughts past and the future. Just feel those subtle life force vibrations. Okay, next we'll do the knee bending. On the in-breath, again, lift up on the toes, 
raising the arms up front for balance. On the out breath, bend the knees and lower the body down, balancing on the balls of the feet. Up. up on the toes, out breath, in, Oh. Mm. Oh. Feel the increased heartbeat, other pulsations, the aches or pains. Feel the outline of the standing body and all those different sensations coming and going. The flow of impermanent all those changing sensations you notice, cellular vibrations, those are the flow of impermanent, moment by moment. Are there any thoughts going through your mind, any sounds going through your ears? It's calm, last a moment, vanish. Something else comes. So even in yoga, you can practice Vipassana meditation. Next, we'll do the side bending on the in breath. Raise both arms up. Keep your fingers and arms straight, close to your head. On the out breath, bend over the right side. Keep your arms and hands parallel to each other like railroad tracks. In breath, lift up. Pause a moment. Then the other side, out breath. Feel the stretch in the side, in breath up, into the right, out breath. In, out. Once more to each side. The out breath, lower the arms. Let's close the eyes. Keep feeling the body. Feeling the clothing touching the skin, the outer body. Feeling the subtler sensations, life force sensations under the skin. Pulsations, warmth. Tingling. 
activated life force. Cellular vibrations charged up with oxygen. In the deep breathing, holding in the breath, all the oxygen can get out. Charge up the cells of the body, charging a battery. Feel that. Okay, now spread the legs apart about three feet. We'll hold the arms out to the side. We'll do twisting from right to left. We'll breathe in. On the out breath, twist to the right. Keep your eyes on the hand going back. In breath, come back to the front. Let your feet turn with the body and then go to the other side with the next out breath. In breath, front. Just keep alternating sides with the breathing. In. Once more to each side. Come back to the front, lower the arms. Just feel each foot pressing the floor. Just feel the sensation of the legs spread apart. Feel your hands touching the legs. A little subtle pulsation in the fingers. Feel the clothing touching the skin of your chest and your arms. Feel the head balanced on top. Feel little prickly sensations on your face. Feel the lips touching together the eyes and the sockets. The mind should be able to effortlessly just notice all those things in the space of a few seconds. If you can do that, that's the beginning of deep awareness. Ability to notice many things in a very short period of time. You know, keeping the legs apart, we'll do the backward and forward bending, keeping the hands touch the front of your legs. Breathe in. On the out breath, bend forward, keep your head lifted up, looking out straight ahead. Let your hands come down to your kneecaps. Keep the arms and the legs straight or flatten the spine. Get the hump out of the spine. In breath, lift up. Move your hands under the buttocks for support. Let the head go back on the out breath. Breathe out, gently bend backwards. Keep your eyes open, look at the ceiling. 
in the arch of the spine, in breath, carefully lift up. On the next out breath, the hands come down below your knees. Still keep the head up. Feel the extra stretch in the back of your leg. With the little bones in the lower spine, stretch out. The in-breath, lift up. Again, hands under the buttocks. Out-breath, carefully bend back. And bend back a little more. In breath, lift up. And the third time, let the hands come down as far as you can toward your ankles or feet. And then hold on to them. Hold that stretch. With the little bones in the lower spine, stretch out where the lower spine joins the pelvic girdle. And the stretch in your hamstring mus muscles. Now, in breath, lifting back up. And once more, the back bend, just be careful. In breath, up. on the out breath, just relax the shoulders and arms at the sides. Feel the outline of the whole body. So you feel that activated life force, the aliveness of the whole body. Being charged up because of the deep, slow breathing and holding in the breath, massive amounts of oxygen, been able to charge up the remote cells and tissues, life force. Just try to feel that. Or imagine or feel that you're kind of standing on a vibrating machine. Pleasant, wonderful sensation, life force vibration, allowing the consciousness to rest in the present moment. The sensations are so overwhelming, you don't, you don't want to think about anything else. Okay, now bring the legs back together. Stand straight and just feel the whole body. We'll just do one last exercise, the head turning from right to left. So in the in-breath, turn your head to the right. Look over your right shoulder, turn your eyes further to the right, see something behind you. Out breath, turn the head all the way back to the left, and look over the left shoulder. In breath, right. Concentrate into the neck vertebrae, imagining, feeling them loosening up. Out breath to the left. Mm 
in right. Up breath left. On the in-breath, let the head stop in the center, feel the whole body. Standing, standing. Okay, friends, so now let's uh, come back to our seats, get ready for the sitting. Screen might be flickering out there. Don't you don't need to watch the screen. Close the eyes and just listen. Just try to sit straight. Line of the spine and the back of your head in a straight line. Close the eyes, feel the eyes in the socket. Try to feel the outline of the sitting body. Head on top, the arms at the side, and touch them together, the buttocks pressing the sit, pressing the floor, try to hold that big kind of outline of the body and the mind's eye. Just remember sit. Begin some deep, slow breathing like we did during the yoga session. Just to 
the second to the expansion, lower middle and upper chest, hold the air in one or two seconds. Slowly breathe out, let the last bit of air go out of the lungs. Just take several deep, slow breaths like that, developing this basic mindfulness. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, letting go of the past and future. Breathing out, sitting here and now. Breathing in, feeling the whole body. Breathing out, feeling the whole body. And we're going to count the breaths from one to ten to cultivate a more continuous focus on the breathing. I'll do the counting for you and just try to follow that breathing concentration. So for the next expanding in breath, mentally count to one. Hold the breath for one or two seconds. With the contracting out breath, also count to one. The last bit of air go out to the lung. Next in breath, two. Out breath, two. In three, out three, in four. Four. In five. Out five. In six, out six, in seven. Seven. In eight. Out eight. In nine, out 
dan 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 out ten Just continue the counting. Let the breathing return to its uncontrolled, shorter, irregular rhythm. Continue to feel it. Keep your eyes focused on the residual expanding, contracting sensation. Your abdomen, stomach, ribcage, your Knowing when the breath is coming in and knowing when the breath is going out, you know it by feeling, feeling the sensations of the clothing, whether the skin, stomach, the cage, your chest, span. It's a tactile sensation. So make that the primary focus of the concentrated awareness. Tune in to the four phases of each breath cycle. Expanding in breath with a brief pause, contracting out breath with a brief pause, so over and over and over and over. It's become like a scientist looking down to a microscope to observe an experiment. Experiment of breathing. Notice how each breath is different, longer or shorter. Sometimes you feel it more in the abdomen, sometimes you feel it in the ribcage or upper chest. It's always changing. And it pauses in between the breaths of longer or shorter. Just letting go of your thoughts, just let your thoughts come and go in the back of the mind. Keeping sensations. Breathing the body front the awareness. It helps stay focused and to remember you can make these brief mental reminders in in sit. Pauses between the breast and the outline, accepting the body in the posture straight.
while noticing the breathing, concentrating on the breathing, still notice other sensations coming and going in the background, and other places of the body, each sensation, prickly sensation. Things are being. Body keep sitting and breathing. Sitting and breathing. Turning up the power of the mental microscope to notice subtler, more detailed sensations, the breathing process, where other sensations coming and going. Cultivate the insight into coming and going, the permanent, quickly different sensations arising, changing, vanishing. You don't have too many thoughts. I could take a few more deep, slow breaths. Stay awake and alert to the body. The mind is feeling a little sluggish and dull. A few deep, slow breaths. We oxygenate the bloodstream. Be alert for thoughts sneaking up into the mind. Be carried away in thoughts, recognize them as thinking, thinking, and lost, lost. Deep breath, mind back into the 
Breath by breath, moment by moment. Breathing out, sitting, sensations come and go, sounds come and go, thoughts, emotions come and go, thoughts of I, me, your mind come and go. No, just a constant stream of impermanent five aggregate coming and going according to condition. Without letting the mind get stuck with any particular sensation or thought. Being up with a constant stream of change. So we connect it to the breathing center. Oh, 
just changing sensation without sound, arising and vanishing in space, present moment aware. body and mind. Just be alert how quickly certain sensations and thoughts
what perceptions or thoughts arise based on the sound vibration. Sabe Sankara Anichati Nada Panyaya Parsati Atene Bindati Dukhi Yesa Magnu Visu Dukkha Pata Chani Dukkha Maya Pata Chani Maya Sukha Pata Chani Sukha Ontu Sabbe Kipani All conditioned things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. They arise only to last briefly and then vanish. When one sees this with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity to feel. May the suffering be free from suffering. May the fear struck be free from fear. May the grieving be free from grief. In this way, may all beings live. With mindfulness and wisdom. Thus, I invite you to join and finish the meditation by chanting the word Satu. Take time slowly to be chanting on a long out breath, feeling the vibrations in the body and mind. Take a deep breath. So Mindfully place your hands at the edge of your knees. Take one more deep breath, stretch the head back, pull the hands on the knees to arch your spine back. And 
lift the head up on an in-breath. On the out-breath, press chin to the top of the chest. Stretch the neck vertically. Lift the chin up level on an in-breath. Relax on the out breath. Put a smile on your face. Okay, friends. So this brings our Wednesday evening Dhamma uh, discussion and meditation to an end. We're able to have uh, at least uh, some moments of some peaceful present moment awareness. With some more insights into Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta. So next week we'll be going on to some other uh, topic of. Dhamma meditation practice. I send out notice about that on the next mailing on next Monday. So until them, until that time, friends, uh, just remember mindfulness a day keeps dukkha away. That means practicing daily meditation and also incorporating the M and M's minutes of mindfulness every hour and during the day stopping for one minute a couple of deep slow breaths bring your mind back to the present moment of the body reflect on the Dhamma. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. <laughs> Thank you, Bhante. Thank you everyone. Thank you, very true bonding. Thank yeah. you. Everyone have a good night. Thank you again. Thank you, Bonte.